Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Tim O'Brien. He's going to share some stories about his friendship with John Prine. But I want to say how I met John Prine, which is uh, having known Steve a little bit. There was Prine at the Edmonton Folk Festival. He's backstage um, hanging around with uh, members of the band. Uh, it was as it existed at that point. Rick Danko and Garth Hudson and uh, I think Richard Manuel were there. Anyway, so they're, they're all hanging around, and I got the gumption up to go up to John's Prine and say, uh, hey, uh, I'm a f- friend of Steve Goodman's. I said, you know, I just wanted to say I really uh, love your music, and Steve... I know you were really close to Steve, and we missed Steve. It was only a year or two after he had died. And uh, she said, Brian said, you know, uh, Steve is doing really good. He's got a new record out, <laughs> and uh, he just won a Grammy or something, you know. <laughs> he said, don't worry about Steve. <laughs> but that's how I met John, and um, he was just like an old shoe. He was like a regular guy, you know. It, it, it was disarming uh, that way, because he's kind of a songwriting god, you know, an American icon of of uh, the arts, and uh, he's really easy access. And it's just like you got to swallow hard to not kind of fawn all over the guy because you don't want to ruin it, you know. I didn't want to press myself on him or anything, but I, you know, always check in with him. So, you know, but then he was a fan. He was always aware of what you were doing, and uh, he was always following the music and. Hot Rise was on a reunion tour, I think 2014 or something, and uh, maybe maybe a little after that. And uh, we played at the Station Inn, and I look over there. Here's Prine sitting on the, the last seat in the house on the far left, you know. He said, I've never seen you guys. I always wanted to see you. And he actually, you know, snuck in the back door and sat right down there and watched the whole show. This, you know, makes you, makes you feel good. But, you know, uh, I got to participate on a couple recordings one was uh, when he made a uh, duet project with uh, Mac Wiseman. And Mac was another guy that I knew, you know. I'd go to Earl Scruggs' house for his birthday parties, and all these guys would be there, including Mac. Uh, or maybe uh, Lester Armistead's country store. He had a place up in uh, Goodlitzville that was kind of like an old store and have jam sessions up there, and all the Scruggs and Mac Wiseman, Jim and Jesse, they'd all be up there. So I knew Mac, and so... Then my buddy Ferg, Dave Ferguson, was producing this record with John and Mac. And they had a little table, like a, you know, like a, almost like a little dinner table. And they'd put these desk stands, uh, microphone stands on them. You know, like a little, like a little disc with the, the thing. And then, the, you know, the, it's just like this tall. So they're sitting there with the lyrics in front of them, singing, facing each other with two mics, and then uh, the band, you know, be close around him playing. So I got to play guitar on two or three songs, and then uh, later, uh, when he was doing a second version of the In Spite of Ourselves, whatever, that the duets with female artists, Kathy Matea is another associate that I've worked with over the years and been helped greatly by, and she was recording a duet, and they were... One of them was uh, Dreaming My Dreams of You by Alan Reynolds. Or is it by Alan Reynolds? Or we're in Alan's studio recording his song and Kathy and I. Anyway, I'm looking, I'm looking through the glass at the two of them. They're in the same isolation booth singing on this, kind of on the same mic, I think. And uh, I actually have a little short video clip of them singing, you know, warming up, snuck that. John, you know, he, he loved... All the old music, you know. I saw him. What's great about Prine is uh, when I moved to Nashville, I would take the kids, my kids, my sons are all grown now, but at the time in 96 and 7, they were in uh, just starting grade school and just starting high school. They're eight years apart. And uh, so I'd go drop them off at uh, their school. And then oftentimes I'd go, if I had a grocery shop, I'd do that then. And so... You know, it's like 8.15 in the morning. I'm going up to the egg aisle, and there's Prine. <laughs> you know? And that's the thing. He's the guy you see in the egg aisle. <laughs> Did you see him at meeting threes around town? Yeah. Yeah, you'd see him at uh, down here at the Copper Kettle, which is the closest one to my house. And he'd, you know, he'd signed on the wall, Meet Loaf Wednesday, John Prine. And uh, then... Um, 
at Arnold's for sure. And then when he had a he had a record release for that second duets record, and uh, he took everybody out to eat at Arnold's. That was great. Yeah, I would have loved to cook for him. I invited him over here, and his Fiona said they wanted to come over here sometime, but they just never. They I would have a picking party on January first, a lot, uh, number of years, and uh, it was kind of open house. He got a little wild after a while, but um, they threatened to come by, but never did. The Jim Rooney and the Irregular shows were always great because whoever it was Rooney's a friend of Rooney, which is that's a wide that's a wide uh, palette there. They would come by, and he might get them up on stage. And Pr John Prine was definitely a regular participant there and you know he'd get up and and play a song he might play like a, my bucket's got a hole in it you know and then he might do one of his songs but I, the first time I saw that happen was the Hodam family that was um like a once a year gig they were uh I think they played at a place called the box seat and it was over in Green Hills, like a little bar. And they just started at, you know, five in the afternoon and went till midnight. It was just like this long, long uh, jam. And it was like about 15 people on stage. And they're all really highly qualified and ultra tasteful. It seemed like, and that's what the Irregulars gigs are like. Uh, it would be all these great musicians, you know, could have been A-team players, like Dave Pomeroy and, you know, Dan Dugmore and Pete Wozner and all these players. And uh, it was way too many people to make sense. And yet it sounded perfect because they were so ultra tasteful. I remember going to the station in and going, man, whoever's mixing this gig is a genius because how can you do this? And then I looked at the soundboard. <laughs> There's nobody there. <laughs> and... Uh, Richard uh, Richard Bailey played banjo with him every time, and uh, he was the guy that set it up. He said, "Yeah, we don't need to mix stuff. People know, you know, they're playing mixing people playing on mics and and you know pianos coming through directs and, but it all, they're just geniuses uh, themselves. The musicians here, you come to Nashville, and uh, a guy described it to me. He said, you know, you run around a track." around your hometown, think you're doing pretty good, you know, make a pretty good time. Come to Nashville and you realize, man, you got to up your game a lot, you know. People are lapping you all the time. <laughs> so uh, it really is true. You learn about timing because you just have to. You learn about taste and uh, dynamics, you know. It's, it's a lesson. It's a hard lesson to learn. Those are, those are supreme lessons, though, and... Nashville is, is contagious. You, you've got to learn or, or give it up. <laughs> <laughs> One of the great shows I saw was uh, at uh, the Romp Festival up in Owensboro, Kentucky. They, they had them on a Saturday night, and um, I played with my group, and then uh, everybody stayed around to hear John. And it's just like, I don't know, that was really great to hear him in Kentucky, you know kind of nearby where he's from, really. It's, not, it's just one county away, I think. Muhlenberg County, that's like a pretty heavy-duty place. He knew about, you know, his parents knew about his relatives' aunts and everybody knew about Bill Monroe and Merle Travis and all that being around there. His aunt, his great aunt or something said, you know, we always thought Bill Monroe and Charlie Monroe were like mafia guys or something because they'd come around in these big cars and fancy suits, you know, coming back to Rosine, Kentucky. What the heck are these guys into now? At that same festival up there at Romp, there was a security guard named uh, Mark um, Schultz, Mark Schultz, black man. And he was a, I think he was a deputy sheriff or maybe he was a policeman in the county or whatever. And uh, somebody said, oh, this is Arnold Schultz's grand nephew or something. And Arnold Schultz is a guy that played with Bill Monroe's Uncle Penn and with Bill Monroe and taught him how to play rhythm guitar. He taught this guy, Mose Rager, who, how to play guitar. And Mose taught Ike Everly and Merle Travis. I mean, the guy's, uh, Arnold Schultz is like the unsung 
father of country music that we don't know about. We know about D. Ford Bailey being a black man. He was an early star of the Opry and so influential, but we didn't, we don't know so much about Arnold, Arnold Schultz. There's no recordings of him, but you can feel the reverberations of his influence through these people, the Everly brothers, Bill Monroe, all the, every bluegrass thing, every Chet Atkins lick you hear, you know, it's really kind of comes from this guy. And uh, he was a railroad worker that was itinerant, apparently would, would go off times to New Orleans during the winter months. You'd, when he came back in the spring, they said you could hear him through the woods. He'd be walking around with his guitar just playing as he went. And uh, you knew he was back in town. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And Bill said he uh, played dances with him, and uh, they'd you know come home at sunup. They'd, they'd break the dance up at sunup and ride home on their horses. <laughs> But anyway, so we met this guy, Arnold, uh, uh, Mark Schultz. And I said, well, uh, so what do you know about your uncle Arnold? He said, well, my, my grandfather and him had a band, and my grandfather kept his band going, and uh, he showed me a picture of them. And they had drums and guitar and, I think, piano. So they probably played dances and stuff. And um, He said... Well, he's, uh, I said, well, where is he buried? And he said, uh, he's down in Rosine, which is where Bill Monroe's from. He said, he's on the, on the grave, at the graveyard on the other side of the tracks. I said, well, okay. You know, after the festival, the next day, my wife, Jan, and I went down there to find his grave. So we go to Rosine. It's really funny because uh, we're trying to find this other graveyard. I've been to the graveyard where Bill, Bill and Charlie Monroe are, are and their parents um, brothers and sisters, but, uh, there was, didn't seem to be any other graveyards. So there's, we're kind of leaving and we see this woman on the side of the road. She's got on her bathrobe and she's got, she's about, she looks like to be about 80 years old and she's got a cigarette and she's in her bathrobe out by the street. And we stopped and asked her and said, do you know where the other, like the, maybe the African American graveyard is? She said, Oh, there's no African American graveyard here. There's only the one up here on the hill. And that led to a discussion of, you know, I said, Well, I see Bill Monroe up there. She said, Oh, Bill Monroe. Everybody pays so much attention to Bill Monroe, but we have these people that died in the wars and they don't give them any kind of big sign or anything, you know? And uh, so we talked to her and she had the cigarette, you know, the ashes about that long. He's just taking it real slow and telling us all this stuff about the little town. So we figured, huh, what the heck? Uh, this is not the right place for Arnold's grave. So then we go and look. There's this thing called the Internet. We looked it up on the Internet after we got back to where there was service because Rosine has no cell phone service for AT&T, apparently. So then we find out it's in Morganton, Morganton, uh, Kentucky. So we drive over there and it's, uh, there's an African-American graveyard and it's just no markers, just rocks, just little, you know, rocks about this big marking graves. And, uh, but somebody had put up a, a memorial, a nice, uh, a, quite a large stone uh, sculpture with, you know, a tribute to Arnold and how he started this thumb picking style that's so popular in Kentucky and Arnold Schultz is a, he's a, you know, a great enigma. And, you know, it's, it's telling that his, this grand nephew didn't realize, you know, he thought he was buried in Rosine. He knew where Rosine was. That's interesting to me because he knows where Rosine is. He knows that Bill Monroe's from there and he knows that there's that connection. So he just assumes he's buried there, but he's not. For, I think at first I heard that Fiona was, sick with COVID and then found out that she, she got better and he, he got diagnosed and then he went in the hospital. They were over in Europe and coming back and um, got back home and she was real sick. And then he followed her in the hospital and died. So I, I don't know, I don't know uh, how I found out. I think I found out just by the internet somehow real quick in the morning it was real early on in the pandemic, early mid-April or something. And uh, it's like, okay, this is real. We're losing people right and left, and there's no uh, sense to it. There's no, uh, you know, uh, right and wrong about this. You know, they shouldn't be taking 
John Prime, but this he's just as vulnerable, vulnerable as anybody. And uh, even though the world should be protecting somebody like John Prime from any kind of danger, you know, we're all vulnerable to this. And uh, but it was just so tragic. It was like this is uh, somebody I knew, somebody who had encouraged me, somebody who uh, personally encouraged me, but also it was just the very nature of his music and the fact that it was there was encouraging. Um, just somebody like that to pass, it's like, oh, this is really one of the great tragedies of our time that we're facing here. And it's going to be worse before it gets better than it was. I uh, was at the Vancouver Folk Festival back in the day when I was playing with Hot Rise. It was probably 1982 or three. They put people up in uh, college dormitories. There were quads of, like, each group got a suite of, like, three rooms with a little kitchen area, you know, a living room or something. On our floor, was a, there was a Russian balalaika group. We got to be friends with this guy who played the bass balalaika, and he didn't speak any English. But he uh, he loved coming over to our room and hanging out because we played playing music. Anyway, uh, so I'm going up the elevator. Maybe the second day we're there, and there's this guy with a he's got a Harmony Sovereign guitar, you know, like a look like a triple O sized guitar, no case, beat to hell, you know. I said that's a nice guitar. He says, Yeah, you like that? He said. I said, Yeah, it's nice. He says, You want to buy it? And that was Towns Van Zandt. <laughs> <laughs> so turned out Towns was on our floor with Mickey White. Was that his accompanist? I think Mickey White. The two of them were in one of the suites. So that night, Towns and Mickey came over and they played music and Towns told a lot of stories. Um, he told a story about being in El Paso. I think this is a famous story. I didn't even really comprehend all of it at the time, but I've heard the story since where he had all this money that he'd made on a tour or something. And they went across to a boy's town, they call it across in Juarez and lost it all. He said, I, man, I was flush. And at the end of the story, he was broke, <laughs> <laughs> but that was towns. And, uh, I was around him that night and, uh, at other event, occasionally other events. I didn't get close to him, but I, that was really, that's another one. When we had just moved to Nashville, my ex and my children and I, uh, in 96, and I think it was maybe that year. I don't know what that year he died. It was sooner after that. And Guy Clark spoke at his funeral. He said he'd been rehearsing for that gig all his life, you know. We'd played together. Uh, he would have hot rice to help him do an encore. I found out later that he did that to anybody who was around. You know, they, you, would, you would play City of New Orleans with him. First you'd do Mama Don't Allow, and then you'd do City of New Orleans with him. But uh, so I was buddies with Steve. I, he was uh, a good, and he, was, he endorsed me early on. I played a gig in Chicago. I got a week long gig there, and he came to the matinee. Those gigs were, the old, Earl of Old Town, you played three sets a night, and then on Saturday, he played like five sets. It ended at four in the morning or five in the morning. And uh, he alternated sets with another artist. So there were like 10 sets of music going on on Saturday nights, going to about 5.30 in the morning. And then you'd do a matinee the next afternoon. So here comes Steve on the matinee, and I'm completely cooked. But he, a, a, a mutual friend had brought him, and we went out to eat. And then we went to Steve's place and played music for a couple hours, and it was fantastic. Steve carried my guitar. He said, this is the worst part of the business. He carried my guitar for me. I saw him play at Boulder at Tulagi. Uh, as a uh, famous club on the hill near the university there. And uh, he had come into the music store where I was teaching lessons and talked to the clerk there. He was a buddy of mine. So he went down to see the show, and that was around the time of his first or second record. And I'd seen him, I think I'd seen him at a bluegrass festival. Yeah, I'd seen uh, 73 or so, I think it was. I went to one of these giant peace, love, and bluegrass festivals, which was really dogs and drugs and bluegrass <laughs> festivals put on by Jim Clark. And uh, he 
was on this side stage that was that had Newgrass Revival and John Hartford and uh, Steve Goodman and the Country Gentleman, and he started. The Country Gentleman had played their set, or maybe they were about to, and he said, uh, "Doyle, you guys want to come up and play this with me?" And they got the, the Country Gents all got up and sang "City of New Orleans" with Steve because they had recorded it. And that's the way Steve was. He wanted to jam with everybody, you know. At the finale of the festival, there'd be 100 people on stage, and he'd be back there strumming the hell out of his guitar, you know, just uh, just into it. So Steve started coming out to Telluride, and I'd been playing there with Hot Rise and before that with Ophelia Swing Band. So having met him in Chicago um, and sort of, you know, felt like we were on a you know, first-name basis, a year or so later, he was back in the hospital with leukemia. So all the time I'd met him up to that point, I didn't really realize that he'd had this health crisis that he'd been through and and sort of had made a vow that he'd just be the best possible version of Steve he could while, he's, while he was still alive. And that kind of explains a lot about him, just generous about everything and joyful about his performances and everything. So I heard that he was in a hospital. So Hot Rise was making our first record. And uh, we had the mixes, and so I put them on a cassette, and I sent them to the hospital. Somehow got the address. So the next next June, you know, that was probably like February or something. The next June, he comes up to the Hot Rise bus and knocks on the door and says, man, I want to thank you for sending that that tape. It really helped. I just thought, that's crazy. <laughs> But I think he really meant it. So he asked us to sit in, and we did the city of New Orleans and the Mama Don't Allow and everything. And uh, and then he had this tiny little little glass bottle with a substance in it. There was just a tiny trace of it in there for us. <laughs> and uh, that was Steve. And, uh, you know, every time we'd see him after that, we would do that. Um, he would come when we played at uh, L.A. at the... Uh, Santa Monica, actually, at the uh, McCabe's guitar shop. He would come down and want to try a new song out. He said, Can, do you mind if I play a song before your second set? And he'd get up, and he did this in Chicago, too, at Earl of, not at Earl of Old Town, but somebody, somebody else's troubles. He'd come and he'd want to try a new song out, you know, perform it, perform it for folks for the first time or second time or whatever. And then we would, uh, we would uh, hang out or whatever and play later, but... That had to be a special thing for the audience, wasn't it? Really cool for the audience. And, you know, they all they generally knew exactly who he was. And it was always a good song. And, uh, you know, he was stellar. I, I always felt like, why are you, you don't need to practice this. You got it cold. He played the hell out of the guitar. He, he overplayed it, maybe. You know, he played more strings than he was meant to hit, but it didn't matter. It was always sounded good. And one of the times at Chicago... Um, he was partners, ownership, part owner of a club called Somebody Else's Troubles, which was the title of one of his songs, that uh, name of the club. And his partners were Fred and Ed Holstein, who were folk singers from Chicago, and uh, Bonnie Kolak, I think, who was another folk singer up there. So he comes to the club, and Hot Rise is playing, and he's, he's with Jethro Burns. And... Uh, Jesser Burns is like a ultra hero of anybody that's ever thought about playing mandolin. You know, you hear him play, and you just, that's like miles above just where anybody would be able to go. And uh, so he brings Jethro down, and uh, so I'm thrilled. And uh, so I showed my mandolin to Jethro, and he said, uh, oh, he said, oh, this is a nice mandolin. He says, my mandolin's got a real big fat neck on it. It's kind of wider fingerboard than normal. I had it made that way. And Jethro says, wow, this is a lot different to what I play. He says, mine's more like a pencil. He says, but uh, it only takes about five. He's playing away on this thing. He says, it only takes a couple minutes to get used to it, though. <laughs> and he just, so he sat in with him, sat in with us, and uh, that was the beginning of another great friendship, you know. Jethro loved to play with uh, Red Knuckles and the Trailblazers. And he had, uh, Red Knuckles had, uh, you know, everybody in the Hot Rise band had their alter ego character. Waldo Otto was our steel player, so so Jethro became the elder Otto. He was the elder Otto, and we had some, you know, uh, Western, you know, bolero jackets that 
we had for people to wear sitting in that matched a couple other jackets we wore. So he would, you know, find a cowboy hat and put on sunglasses. And we asked him on a show one time down in Texas if uh, what it was like when Waldo was born. Because Waldo plays as a buffoon. He's kind of like part Ralph Cramden and part Cousin Jody. If you ever seen Cousin Jody, you know, played without his teeth. <laughs> played the steel in a comic way. Physical comedy. So we asked Jethro what it was like when, you know, Waldo Otto was born. He said, well, you know, uh, it was really difficult to get a diaper that would do the job. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the way I describe it is more like a parachute. <laughs> uh, Steve, I'm not, I'm not into the baseball so much, so I, he didn't talk to me much about that, although... He was crazy for it, I'm sure. And I knew that he'd written that song about the Dime Cubs fan last request. And they, they actually did fulfill his request. Albanetta did spread his ashes at home plate or whatever. Well, what I, all I know is that he'd written, Steve had written a song called A Dying Cubs Fan's Last Request. And uh, that he uh, wanted his ashes spread at Wrigley Field. And, uh, and apparently the ashes sat on Albanetta's, his manager's desk for years until he finally was able to get the request filled. So I, I wished I'd have been there for that. I know some friends of mine went for the event. And uh, one was Harry Waller, who is the guy that introduced Steve to me. I heard about Steve's passing. Um, he had gone to uh, Seattle for some kind of special, you know, last ditch kind of treatment. I don't know how I heard. Um, that was, I think, before the internet, and it was uh, word of mouth. It might have been through a friend. I'm not sure how I found out about Steve, but that was really hurtful. A really, you know, a real uh, blow. Uh, Brian Bowers was kind of helping him, I think. They were buddies, and um, Steve was kind of hanging at his house before he went to the hospital. And I think his... Some of his relatives were living at his house and uh, trying to help him through that. One of the first times I hung around with Guy was that uh, Robert O'Keefe booked a gig in Boulder at this club, this kind of funky club that I used to play. And he, he uh, had Guy play with his band. I hadn't met him. I just maybe just barely met him that night bef before he played or something. And then, uh, then after the show, Guy was everybody's best friend. And, and Robert explained that he says, you know, he sort of turns a corner at some point during the evening after he's had enough to drink and his gig is over. And then he's really happy about everything. And uh, so we were friends as, you know, he made friends that way. Uh, my sister and I did a tour of Ireland and it was her, her first visit there. And we were we were co bill with a uh, guy and Travis Clark. His son was playing the bass with him. So we uh, we played three shows in Ireland, three or four shows in Ireland. And then we played uh at the Cambridge Folk Festival also, and he was there. We got to know each other a little bit better on that trip. He came over here once, uh, not long before he died. Um, I'd have these jam sessions on the January 1st, and you know, it was like bluegrass jams and a lot of fiddle tunes and that kind of thing. And Guy came and he said, uh, I said, well, listen, I'm going to uh, make sure there's a place to park right by the door so you don't have to get around. For, you, you don't have to go far. He was pretty frail at that point. And, uh, but he brought his guitar, came in, and uh, I can't believe nobody asked him to sing a song, not even me. And what he did the whole time was he rolled cigarettes, you know, special tobacco, and he made his own uh, nice, uh, nicely formed cigarettes. And uh, I said, you can, you know, nobody else can smoke in here, but you can. And he sat and he enjoyed the evening, uh, the afternoon into the evening, and uh, never played a song, but he rolled a lot of cigarettes. And uh, it was great, you know. Those those jams, uh, we had John Hartford here one year. My son, uh, who was maybe, well, he was on second or third grade. I said, what did you like about yesterday's party? He said, I like that old fiddler guy. And that was uh, Hartford. I can't believe, you know, the people I've met in this town, and it's, uh, it's an amazing community, and I'm lucky to know them. I played the guitar that he had that day 
uh, here at the at the jam. It's a it's a beefy, it's a it's a lightly braced, really lively guitar, and uh, but a beefy neck and almost like a classical neck. It was really a cool guitar. I think I maybe saw it in process at uh, in his basement. You know, go over there to write with John. I mean, with uh, go over there to write with uh, Guy. I was making a record called The Crossing. I wanted to kind of, th that project started with the idea of uh, finding songs that were common, uh, common songs and also common themes of people from Ireland and the United States, particularly Appalachia, I guess, trying to sort of connect the dots, you know, the influence and um, recombine those, that sort of Irish Celtic kind of thing with old time music. But it quickly morphed into the idea of writing songs. Um, ta uh, what's a Pierce Pettis and I wrote a song that that we really liked, and I started writing more songs with other people. And so, I a friend of mine told me about this thing called the San Patricio Battalion. They were in the Spanish or the Mexican American War. They were a bunch of conscripts, German and Irish mostly, that had been marched down to Texas to defend. Texas against uh, Santa Ana. A whole bunch of them defected and fought, fought on the other side, and they renamed themselves the San Patricios after St. Patrick because they were mostly Irish. You know, they were Catholics, and they were uh, looked down upon. You probably Some of them probably hadn't learned how to speak English yet, you know, but that's the job you could get was go in the Army. So they fought for the other side. They were artillery, and they fought with distinction, and they're heroes in Mexico. There's monuments to them down there at uh, uh, Churubusco, where they, where they were all defeated finally in the end, and uh, they were branded. They made it. They put deserter brands on their cheeks, on their face, you know, a D. And uh, a lot of them were hanged, and some of them, including their leader, were they got away somehow. But uh, so I called up guy. I said, "Well, let's, you know, here's this topic I want to write about." And he said, "Oh." So we got together. He he didn't have any idea about that story. He had no idea about it. He said, I know somebody who does. So we called up this woman whose family has a big ranch down, I think, by uh, Victoria, maybe, down, you know, uh, south of uh, Corpus Christi, along the coast there. She said, oh, those people, uh, there weren't that many of them, and uh, they probably weren't really, uh, they weren't really Americans or something. She was kind of funny about it on the phone. And so anyway, anyway, we guy always had a joint, a glass of wine for you, you know, you could try to get something done. And uh, but it was just part of the routine. And uh, we ended up writing a song and like both liked it. So I love that you have this really heavy topic and then you're like, oh, Guy Clark. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when Guy came out with his record, Dark, and uh, Verlin said, I don't know why you call it this. I never thought of you as dark. And, he, of course, he means exactly opposite. You know, he's very dark. Yeah, I think he was, yeah, he was fun to be around. He uh, he just liked everybody's, he li he really liked everybody's music. And, uh, you know, he liked talking about music. He liked hearing music, and he liked fiddle tunes. He really liked old-time fiddle tunes, which was surprising to me. He wanted me to play fiddle tunes for him and stuff, and... Uh, we got to be, you know, pretty decent friends. I mean, I wasn't, again, I'm like in awe of these people. I don't really want to bother them too much. But I find over the years that I, when I have an excuse to approach somebody like that, they're very friendly, you know. When Guy was really sick uh, in later years, I went over one day and I said, well, Guy, I want to come over and make make some food for you. So I went over and brought all the stuff and made gumbo. And uh, just hung out with him. You know, it takes process takes an hour and a half or so to get it started, really just to get it started cooking. And then I left a big pot of gumbo for him. And and, uh, and then maybe six or eight months later, Daryl Scott and I were going to go over and cook his place. And uh, we had all the food. And then, uh, and then the storm came up and the power went out. And uh, we kept trying to reach Guy. We talked to him on a cell phone. He said, no, no power, no power. So finally, we just gave up and we cooked. Uh, we cooked it at our house <laughs> and ate the food and didn't get to see Guy that day. But it was a nice idea. 
Yeah, I was uh, I was at Douglas Corner when guy made a a live record, and it it was uh, the band was I think Travis played the bass and uh, Kenny Malone, probably Verlin Thompson and Daryl Scott, I'm pretty sure. And uh, I'd just gotten back from the UK. I don't know what time of year it was. Jay Douglas was sitting. They they did it in and around. They were in a circle, and they had the the chairs and tables around them. And I was over on, uh, I guess on the South side of the club and Jerry, I could see Jerry Douglas and his crew on the, on the North side, kind of looking at me. And I, apparently I kept falling asleep. <laughs> I just got back from England and I kind of like, uh, slow songs are going like this, <laughs> but I was there and that's a great record. Uh, well, I knew Daryl at that point and I'd met Verlin and stuff and I knew Guy and Travis and I just, I think uh, I hadn't played with Kenny before. That was another guy I met through Daryl. You know, losing people like John Hartford and John Prine and Guy Clark, Kenny Malone is, uh, it's it's really tough if you've been around them and you collaborate with them and, and uh, they hold up, they're sort of the lab standard for a lot of us, you know, of a certain generation. They're all a little bit older than me. And uh, so one thing I realized is I'm really lucky to be still around. And uh, and like Steve Goodman's vow, once he got over leukemia the first time, that he would do the best he could with what Daisy has left. That's a lesson that keeps peeking its head up and saying, remember that lesson? When anybody passes away, you, you remember quick, hey, that's really the only good I get out of anybody like that dying or anybody dying. It's like, okay, we're all headed there. We're all in the checkout line, but uh, it's important that we make the best of it while we got the time. So, you know, uh, Steve Earl, I remember of some benefit concert he did. And uh, he said, you know, if, uh, if a bomb dropped on this building, you know, it's all his crowd, and it's people like I'm mentioning. He said, if a bomb dropped on this building, Nashville would be exactly the same <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and maybe he's right. Uh, it all exists like this. is like this big, uh, you know, if you think of a cell, and it's like the nucleus is this sort of commercial country game. Uh there's so much other stuff around the outside that's way more interesting. And that's where I, that's where I walk. That's where I live. And, um, I think that that other stuff, it, I think that that nucleus needs that, even though you might not notice it if you only look at the, at the center of it. And it's like this, I, I've also likened it to a, like a funnel, like, uh, only some folks get in that funnel. You know, I'm, I've, I've come close to the edge and it's kind of spilled in briefly and it's splashed out again. You know, with a few songs getting recorded by other people, that's really been good. But it's good to, you know, it's a good place to, uh, to, to be because you might actually make something happen. But you don't have to be, you don't have to go down that tube in the funnel. You can sort of exist around the edges. And uh, it's also like, uh, you can liken it to fishing, like... Uh, you know, fishing for songs and for success out in Boulder, Colorado was pretty good. But um, come to Nashville, you can catch a lot bigger fish now and again. And uh, I noticed that right away. Um, writing a song with Daryl Scott at Jack's Tracks and, you know, at the building there and their publishing office, the Forerunner Publishing uh, down there. They've set up this appointment with me and Daryl Scott. And we ended up writing the song. Um, and the song plugger for the publishing company uh, walks by, says, what's that? And I said, well, we're working on a new song. He says, let me, let me hear it as soon as you're done. And, well, because Garth Brooks was downstairs doing something in the studio, he comes up and walks by and he says, whatever they're writing in there, let me hear that. I mean, I just wander into this and... Uh, so that's a big fish. He he heard the song and wanted to record it. And uh, so what I moved here for was to interface a little bit more with that so I could put my kids through school. And uh, it worked out. 
one year at the uh, Philly Folk Festival, uh, somebody told me I should check out this group, the Battlefield Band. They're fiddler. They said their fiddler's just like 19, but he's really good. He just plays just the right thing. The fiddle player's name was John McCusker. We were talking. I just was. And she said, you play. The, I said, I really like your fiddle playing. And he said, do you play? I said, yeah, I work at it. You know, he's. He says, just keep, keep working at it. And, you know, he says, just got to keep keep doing it. It'll it'll come. I said, thanks. And uh, about a half hour later, I'm up on stage, and he goes, oh, you asshole. <laughs> you know, I'm playing fiddle. Anyway, so we got to be fast friends. And then, you know, one thing leads to another. Pretty soon, John's, John's hired to be a sideman for Mark Knopfler. And I saw the show at the Ryman. I got to meet Mark after the show. And a couple of years later, Mark, was getting ready to do a world tour. Or, you know, he's going to tour U.S. And, and Europe. And John, his wife was going to have a baby, their their first baby. So he wanted to get a sub for the five weeks in the U.S. So they called me. When I saw that show at the Ryman, I thought, I love Mark Knopfler, but I don't know why he has all these other instruments there. I really like, I would just like to hear him play the guitar and sing. And, you know, it's kind of like, I couldn't even hear the vocals, even though I knew the songs. I thought, that's kind of funny, but I guess that's what it is. And then when he called, when they called, I went, I was convinced to, to give it a whirl. And uh, it was it was really good pay. And uh, I thought, well, this is a, a way to check this out. Certainly touring in another uh, style was one of the things that was interesting. But really what was interesting was that Mark really it became very clear during rehearsals that he heard everything and really wanted this texture. He really wanted to manipulate these sounds that he had added to the band. It was really important to him to express what he wanted to express. And, uh, well, what was interesting about Mark's uh, guitar rig was he had these big, um, Marshall stacks behind him. I think a couple of big old speaker cabinets, at least one big one. But they were dummy cabinets. They had like a twin, uh, like a, a pro, or what, what, I guess a deluxe, a really nice deluxe reverb, and maybe a, something smaller, a Princeton, maybe a small Marshall in there. There's probably two cabinets and had different amps in each one, but he had this guy, Glenn, who's his guitar tech. And Glenn would be behind that. He'd kind of sneak up in the dark behind there and adjust the amps and and just the input so that he was going through the right one for the right sound i mean talk about being particular about everything he had this nailed but it was disguised one time uh mark's young daughter uh came up to him after a show and said daddy there's a man that comes up behind you on the stage and messes with your amplifier i don't know if you know that <laughs> 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 and it was meant to be, uh, you know, on the sly. But uh, I'll tell you, it was funny. Uh, I heard on one of the songs that he sent for me to bone up on ahead of the tour, I thought I heard a banjo, like a claw hammer banjo. So I wrote to him in an email. I said, what about banjo? I thought I heard banjo on this track. He said, no, that's not a banjo. But he said, bring it along. So... Tried banjo on several songs, and I ended up playing it on several things. He had a lot of songs that would start out, like I said, they start out like an acoustic folk song, you know, like one of these songs that would go from G to F, you know, and uh, it would be like a Ralph Stanley kind of a sound playing the banjo against it. He really liked that. And there was one song, uh, Telegraph Road or something, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, it's about stock car racing. His songs are about, you know, the woman, his songs about the guy that started McDonald's or, you know, guys that uh, re retire old seagoing, big sea sh going, you know, cargo ships and how they run them into the ground. Funny topics. This one's about stock car racing. Starts out real quiet and I'm playing the claw hammer banjo and he's playing some kind of acoustic guitar. At one point in the song, off to my left, Roger Bennett has left the stage with his acoustic bazooki or something and comes back in with a Les Paul and he goes, Wow! 
you know, and I'm going, tinky, tinky, tink, tink. And then pretty soon Mark's on my right and he's got the Les Paul and the two of them are going at it. And I'm going, tinky, 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 tink. I go, okay, <laughs> this is my gig and I love it. <laughs> when we started playing with them, you know, from the very first show, you realize everyone knows all the words to all these songs. He just maybe consciously uses the mix. They know what song it is. They know the words. They turn up the other stuff so you hear that more. He just likes it that way. And he can also do more. Uh, uh, Crocker, his manager, says, you know, he does six nights on and one night off. A lot of singers can't do that many, but he doesn't really sing that hard. He just kind of mumbles, <laughs> you know, so he doesn't wear his voice out. So it's kind of maybe a combination of things. He just doesn't really care. It doesn't matter if they hear it. They're singing along anyway. What's funny uh you know, I knew he was great. You know, I knew some of the Dire Straits things, and I knew the songs were great and unusual. I knew the topics were quite some sometimes unusual. You know, the money for nothing is about guys moving boxes around, and, uh, you know, Sultans of Swing is about another band. It's kind of a funny pop hit. You find out that he's, over and over, he's written, written these great songs about these unusual subjects, and you... You know, you work with Steve Earle or, or uh, Mark Knopfler really quickly, even if you weren't aware of their music, you get aware of it quickly because you, you have to know it inside and out yourself. Um, the only way to get deeper into those somebody's music is to sing it yourself and internalize it. You just realize how good the guy is. So then, then you, you're seeing that everybody knows all the words to him, and you realize that you're... You're just helping him and the audience celebrate this. It's a good lesson because, you know, your ego kind of goes out the window because you're just serving the greater good. Um, it's obviously a good thing. I, you know, my buddy Charles Sotel that I played with in Hot Rise, he's, he often said, you know, if you see somebody that's really famous for their music, you might not like it. You might not have cared about it or whatever, but you see them. And if you, if you actually listen to what they do, you'll find that they are very talented and they do a certain thing that's really valuable. They're really good at what they do. And that's like in spades, you know, when you get in a situation like Mark Knopfler's band, you just realize, God, the guy's really got a lot on the stick. And the anthems, it's the power of, uh, you realize that songs have a lot of power. Um, his approach is really kind of understated and it's sort of disarming that way. It's not like John Prine or somebody. It's just like great songs and people, he's one of the, one of those who their reputation really is based on what they, it's no hype to it. It's just the real thing. And, uh, there is a real incredible value there. People love, you know, people want the stories, uh, they don't sit around campfires and kind of collaborate on, you know, you know, tell the family stories as much as they used to. Uh, we need singers and songwriters and movies and stuff now and books. It's kind of serve some of the same function, but doing it in a in a group, you know, getting a large group together. There's a certain surge of collective emotion kind of going on there. These big concerts and. Uh, I found it really joyous to play, to be the, you know, little side man on that thing. It was, my manager saw the show in New York and uh, at the, we played at the church that was Reverend Ike's <clears throat> church, or it was a theater that was Reverend Ike's church there in uh, New York City. The staff was so nice, they were still kind of part of that religious organization. But uh, he said, you're having entirely too much fun on this gig. I, I, I've never seen you smile like that. <laughs> So many of the songs were, uh, they would, the arrangements would start really quietly with an, an acoustic form. And he might play acoustic guitar, steel-bodied steel guitar. And then at some point he would shift to a Stratocaster or a Les Paul or something and start really rocking out. We had three weeks, six days a week of rehearsals in London. I mean, that's that enough. That in, its, in itself is really highly unusual. Usually I'd have a rehearsal for one day and then go on tour, maybe a day. He was rehearsing 
not just rehearsing the music, but he's rehearsing the, the sound and the lights and, uh, you know, these digital programmed monitors, mixers. There's eight different monitor mixes on stage, and they're programmed to change throughout the song as things change. It's insane. And uh, the precision and the lighting, working on the lighting of that. And then he, at, in the second, two and a half weeks in, or two weeks in, you start working on clusters of songs, see how they flow from one to another. Your, your parts in a larger group like that, which I'm not used to, it becomes very much a traffic direction thing. You know, you don't want too much going on. You want to call attention to certain things. So everything has to set a certain place so that it sets the right thing off, you know, in front. But this is what Mark was into. And, you know, you would think that that's very restrictive because in a four piece group, you got a lot of room to move. And if, you know, I like playing as a solo, you can just do whatever you want. But I learned that there is wiggle room there is room for expression within those small uh, confines of your role. It was really an interesting uh, learning experience and, uh, and one that I, I try to take to heart now because I, in more recent years, I, I like just to play rhythm and sing and just be the director of the band more than playing a lot of solos or anything like that. And, and it really, that was a really good lesson working with Mark because he really, listen to everything closely. I mean, you couldn't, maybe after the first couple of shows, we would um, meet afterwards and talk about how it went, you know, that's the same evening. And that would be good. And he would explain things. And then the next day, you might be at the sound check and he'd, he'd go up to the light guy and go, hey, by the way, when this thing happens, don't shine the lights over there. It's happening right over here during this part of this. And then we'd rehearse that. He knew it and didn't want it to happen again, you know. And then, uh, so it commands an awful lot of respect. You know, whatever you play, he's going to hear it. He's got it in his ear monitors and uh, he's going to hear it. I'll tell you a really good, a good one on him though. Uh, we were doing this song on this, on the tour, um, Mason and Dixon. And it was a duet on the recording he made was a duet between James Taylor and himself. And they were singing the the voices of Mason and Dixon who surveyed the line that, you know, divides the North and the South. So I'm going to sing the James Taylor part. <laughs> so, you know, rehearsed it, got it through. We played the first gig. It was in Seattle. The next night we played in uh, Vancouver, BC. We would play the show and um, fly after the gig in the private jet to someplace else. Like you might do three shows from the same hotel and fly up and back. It's kind of crazy, the, the high style of it. So anyway, you know, by the time I'd get back to my room after a flight, after a gig, and my, my suitcase would be delivered to my room already. And this is at a time when on my own gig, I'd still be counting out the merch money, you know. I still wouldn't have even packed up my guitar yet. The backstage, there was all, you know, killer backstage food. and But there's all this wine, tons of really nice wines and, you know, buckets full of beer. But I noticed no one was, well, there was two, uh, there's two subs for John McCusker. They had two guys. And uh, because I didn't play Penny Whistles. Or, so they get Mike McGoldrick, who's another old friend from UK, who plays the pipes and the flutes and the whistles and the guitars and stuff. So two of us were kind of the new guys, and we're going, I said, Mike, you notice nobody's drinking any of this wine. We got all this great food, and there's this really nice wine, and nobody's drinking it. And what do you think? Is it off limits, or why is it there? So I asked the tour manager. They had two tour managers. They had one that was dealt with the band and the one that dealt with the money. And then they had the actual manager. So I said to the the tour manager for the band, I said, is there a policy on the wine? Because, you know, it's like, you know, I've got a steak here. I think a little little glass of wine might be nice. He said, oh, yeah, help yourself. I said, well, I noticed no one else is drinking it. He said, well, that's, uh, he said, maybe they just want to stay sharp for the show. I said, oh, okay, well, I won't drink the wine. He says, no, you can drink it if you want. Weird. So I asked the other road manager. He said, oh, well, you know, you can have some wine if you want. Uh, 
And I said, well, nobody else is. Well, maybe they're just trying to stay straight. I said, okay, fine. And I said, well, maybe I should ask Mark. He said, oh, no, don't ask Mark. <laughs> he, doesn't like, he doesn't like confrontation. I said, okay, I won't ask Mark. So uh, this is really like 15 minutes later, me and Mike McGoldrick are in the dressing room. And uh, Mark comes in. He says, oh, how are you guys doing? Uh, no, it looks like they got a nice bit of food. He says, oh, by the way, if you guys want any drink of wine, help yourself. Help yourself. I used to. <laughs> So, so we're, we're looking at each other and going, okay, all right. So we have a glass of wine. So this is the third night of the gig, third night of the tour, and I uh, time came for the Mason and Dixon sign, and I screwed up the lyrics. <laughs> so I'm going, oh, sh shoot, man, Mike, I screwed it all up, man. I guess I shouldn't have a glass of wine. And, you know, by that time, I realized there is a difference. Maybe there really is a difference between one glass of wine and no glass of wine, which usually to me is, is kind of negligible. That night, we've taken our flight back, and uh, I'm walk McGoldrick and I are walking to, the, to our room down the hallway, and I said, I said to Mike, I said, you know, had that one glass of wine, and I had to fuck up the goddamn song, <laughs> proving the point of maybe I shouldn't have wine. And unbeknownst to us, Mark's about 10 steps behind us. He goes, hey, man, don't worry about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know what the answer is, but it was a great tour. I first heard John Hartford on the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. He was the summer replacement for the Smothers Brothers show. And I guess John had been the uh, staff writer for the Smothers Brothers show. He and Steve Martin, a couple of good banjo players, writing comedy. And uh, Mason Williams was another. Um, but anyway, and Pat Paulson. Pat Paulson was one of the funniest guys on the Smothers Brothers shows, I thought. So I saw him, you know, playing the banjo from the audience position at the beginning of the Glenn Campbell show when that was on. And I loved Glenn Campbell. My sister had his first records and we, you know, we learned the songs. And then years later, he started playing in the bluegrass circuit. And I was aware of the uh, uh, aerial plane record. And then the um, morning bugle was kind of, a, kind of the really vital stuff in a lot of ways in his career. I guess the first time I saw him live was at the, one of these peace, love and bluegrass festivals, um, and uh, he was jamming with Newgrass Revival. And then when Hot Rise started in 78, we started playing festivals and we'd be on a festival bill with him. And our banjo player knew, knew John, so he would visit and I got to you know shake his hand and say hello. And he was crazy for fiddling. He loved uh, all the fiddlers. He wanted to hear everybody that played the fiddle and what they had to offer. It was always great hearing him interface with another fiddle player like Vassar or uh, there's a guy named Billy Spears was from Lawrence, Kansas. The two of them hanging out and talking about tunes, you know. So anyway, uh, he would normally play. I would see him most often as a solo. And he was all plugged in. And it was kind of like, it was kind of like it was all show. And I kind of thought some of the stuff is kind of silly. Some of the songs are kind of silly, like uh, a baby on a buggy, you know, <laughs> or uh Granny, won't you smoke some marijuana and stuff? You know, and he's playing to the hippies, and I, I'm one, so I, I understood that. But, you know, we were trying to do our sort of pristine bluegrass thing, and we didn't like the sound of the fiddle plugged in and stuff so much, but he was still a good guy. But then his music started evolving, too, and uh, he started traveling around, for instance, with uh, Roy Husky Jr., and, uh, you know, you'd talk to Roy and him and... Uh, They'd be talking about, well, this bass was on this certain Flat and Scruggs record, you know. This is the same bass, and that kind of stuff was pretty cool. And you know, he was he greatly endorsed Hot Rise. And uh, oh yeah, I remember one time we were playing in Winona, Minnesota, and we were going to do a co bill with John Hartford, and we had just bought a bus. We had bought an old forty one hundred four fifty fifty seven GMC motor coach, you know, Greyhound bus. And it had been used by another band and remodeled inside. It was kind of funky, high-low shag carpet on the ceiling and all around, you know. And uh, But it had a destination sign that had, you know, a spool with all the names of the cities on it. And as it had come, it was unattached. It would just sort of change destination signs on it, 
on its own as you drove down the road. So he didn't know we were playing. He said, oh, he says, oh, it says Chattanooga on, on the front of your bus. I was, I was wondering who Chattanooga was, and we had just bought this bus. <laughs> so that was, that was uh, early on. And anyway, uh, we would see him. And then when I moved to Nashville, uh, I'd go up to his house and stuff. There's a fiddler from uh, Cookville named Fraser Moss. They were buddies, so I said, well, let's go up to Hartford's. Let's see if Hartford wants us to come up. We just go and play fiddle tunes and, you know, hang out in the room that kind of went looked over the, the uh, Cumberland River. Kind of like a pilot house he sort of built onto his house. It looked like he was on the river when you were sitting there. Uh, well, I saw him his last show. It was down at uh, near Austin at the Old Settlers Festival. I was playing there with, uh, probably with Scott Nygaard and Mark Schatz and... Uh, I saw him coming across the parking lot from his bus, and he came up to me, and he said, uh, I can't use this hand. And uh, it was like a look of terror in his eyes. And, uh, you know, he, he'd been through a lot of health problems, but this was pretty distressing. So... Uh, he did the show that night and Nickel Creek was there and they they sat in and did a lot of the show with him. And he emceed and he played his right hand on the banjo and really couldn't fret it, but he'd get in the right key and sort of play along the parts he could play along with it being without it being discordant, you know, and a killer show. Just did a fantastic show. Well, he went home and went to the hospital and uh, nearly died then. And Kevin Burke... And I were doing something. Kevin is an f- old friend, fiddler from uh, Ireland, and uh, he was in town, and, and he said, uh, Hartford, I hear Hartford's in the hospital. And I said, yeah, he is. And he said, well, let's go see him. So we went to see him. I think we brought our fiddles in, maybe play for him or something. But we visited. He was pretty, it was pretty sad. And there's a good story about Kevin as well, I can tell you. Kevin Burke is a good buddy of mine from, uh, he's from he was grew up in London, but his dad was from Sligo. His parents from from west of Ireland, and I first saw him play nineteen seventy six with the Bothy Band. Kind of, you know, they were kind of like the J D. Crow in the New South of Irish traditional music at in the early nineteen seventies. You know, really cutting edge, great hard driving music, beautiful acoustic music. Anyway, so Kevin, I got to know him a little bit and got to be closer and closer. And he told me this Hartford story. He said uh, he's, he had met, you know, he hadn't even met Hartford, but he gets his call one morning about 7.30 in the morning. Is this Kevin Burke, the fiddle player? He says, yeah, this is me. He says, this is John Hartford. And Kevin says, oh, delighted to talk to you. What are you doing? How are you doing? They talk. And he says, do you live at 933, 34th Street South or whatever it is, Southwest? He says, yeah. He says, can I come visit you? He said, yeah. He said, how about in 15 minutes? <laughs> and he had traveled to Portland to play a gig in his bus. And he would oftentimes just be him and a bus driver and, a, you know, maybe a tour manager or somebody with him. And he was parked around the corner. He had traveled to Portland, uh, Oregon, to play a show. And he said, let's go in early and let me see if we can park close to where this guy lives that I want to meet. And they just parked there, and then he just walked around the corner with his fiddle, and they sat all all day and played tunes. <laughs> Get, imagine getting a call like that. <laughs> anyway, so a couple weeks later, he's back out of the hospital, but he's in hospice care. And uh, so people were going up there pretty much every day to kind of hang around and visit. And uh, went up one day. Pete Wernick was in town, and my hot rise compatriot, and uh, Mark Schatz was in town. Um, so we went up there, and Maura O'Connell. Uh, we called up ahead of time before we went up there and said uh, to Marie, his wife, said, is there anything we can do? She said, if you could bring stuff for lunch, because uh, so many people are coming, and I can't even keep up with it. So we went, we stopped at Kroger and got some lunch meat and pickles and potato chips and stuff and bread. Maura, she decided, well, John really likes, uh, he can't smoke pot anymore, but he, he really likes pot brownies. So she, she said, I've got these pot brownies. And we were 
carpool one up there. And she said, uh, well, we probably ought to try one. So we, you know, we kind of split one brownie, my ex-wife and I and, uh, and Maura sort of chewed on a brownie. And so, you know, an hour and a half later, we'd play a little music. And it's time to make some sandwiches. And, and the women were in there trying to spread, spread in the, you know, mayonnaise. And they're going, we're having trouble figuring out which lunch meat. It was like the spinal tap problem. The, the bread didn't fit the size of the lunch meat. And they're kind of trying to figure it out. And it was realized, realizing that the brownies were doing their work. So there's a great, great bunch of music. And Maura sang some song that John requested. And you were sitting out in chairs out in the sun, a beautiful spring day. And he says, uh, that was really good. Sing that again. So he uh, started it and played it again. And uh, this time he sang to the band. You know, a lot of people didn't know the song. He said, that's the two chord there. Or, that's you know, that's the three there. <laughs> you know, so I did it again. And uh, he, he, he said, that's really good. He says, do it one more time. <laughs> so we played it and didn't screw up the chords. And uh, and one of his, uh, a couple of his uh, former side men, Ruth, I can't remember Ruth's name, and um, maybe Connie, who used to be in the string band. With, with They had two, maybe three violins in the band at one point. He said, standing ovation. They, he had to lift him up out of the chair. He said, standing ovation, and went like this. And uh, after we played it the third, the third time. So uh, anyway, the pot brownie story goes on because uh, for some reason we had a recording session that day. Pete Wernick had one. So we left the party, you know, two or three in the afternoon and uh, went down to this, do this session. And I said, boy, that was a great, both Mark Schatz and, and Pete Wernick were on it. And they said, ah, oh. I said, Ben, that was a great afternoon. You know, the pot brownies kind of added a little element to it. He says, pot brownies? Schatz says, pot brownies? I said, yeah. He said, where were they? I said, oh, well, uh, they were there on the thing there, you know, on a, on, a, on a table in the kitchen there. He said, well, I'm going back up there. Maybe I'll try one. So <laughs> another guy was there. It was uh, Matt Combs, fiddle player. Anyway, so Shetz goes up, and he takes a he takes and eats a whole brownie. And uh, about eleven thirty that night, I'm in bed, and just just about to turn on the turn off the lights, and I get a call from from Shetz's wife saying, "Mark's really freaked out. He ate the pot brownie. He doesn't know what to do with himself. And can you go up and help him? He's he's by himself at his house." I said, "Okay." So I get in the I try to reach him on the phone. I can't. So I get in the car drive up there. I'm about halfway out there. And he calls back and he says, what am I going to do? I said, well, just, you know, maybe what, you know, listen to some music or something. And he says, it's just, it'll go away. And he said, I tried to, he said, I got to practice with Bela Fleck tomorrow. And I was listening to that and the stuff's making me crazy. I said, well, try something simpler. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I keep driving and then, uh, I'm talking to his wife on the phone. I said, well, he's freaking out. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. She said, and we both said, how do we get hooked up with this guy? Anyway, uh, uh, he calls back about five minutes later. He says, oh, I threw up. I'm fine now. <laughs> 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 but that was, you know, and then when John died, it was like uh, he had told me, well, I started singing his song, Gentle On My Mind. Uh, somebody asked me to sing it. I, for a, Well, Compass Records, we made a tribute to John Hartford and the New Grange group that I was playing with through them was uh, was participating. So I did Gentle On My Mind, and they backed it up. And uh, and then there was a tribute to him that Mountain Stage did, and it was at the Municipal Auditorium. What's the, the – yeah, the Municipal Auditorium. That's a nice horseshoe place downtown. Uh, theater flat flat floor place with a balcony and they did they had great a great lineup Kathy Matea uh, was on it and um, Riders in the Sky a whole bunch of great groups and I sang a duet with Kathy Matea of Gentle My Mind and he saw and Hartford said you know you should sing that at every show that's the best uh, I've ever heard that song and I really want you to sing that and then it became known that he wanted me to sing it at his funeral and so it's like, okay, well, this is pretty serious. That's a pretty serious request. And, uh, you know, got to make sure you get the gurgling, crackling, you know, 
gurgling, crackling coal mine. What is it? Uh, I, I dip my cup of soup back from a gurgling, crackling coal fire. That's whatever it is. So you got to get that straight if you're going to sing it at the funeral, you know. Man, the people that sang at his funeral were unbelievable. And the stories they told, he was up at his house, you know, outside at a big tent and big spread of food and everything. I mean, the Osborne brothers played. Uh, it was like unbelievable. So I think the band that played Gentle on My Mind, that was the last song to play, be played. Uh, and he had all this moonshine that it, they had gotten laid in for his, for his funeral ahead of time. And his stipulation was that it had to all be drank that day. And uh, so we're drinking this moonshine. We're eating these country ham biscuits and getting ready. And it's uh, Sam Bush, Daryl Scott, Allison Brown, Mark Schatz, and uh, Vassar Clements was there. So we rehearsed this and got practice the song through. A little moonshine thing happened. By that time, uh, Vassar had to go to a gig. He couldn't stay. <laughs> and so uh, Stuart Duncan played the fiddle. But was saying gentle on my mind. And uh, it was like, uh, you realize that some things are bigger than you and your, your ego and your, you know, your own little concerns. You know, it's just singing that song was like, uh, it felt like I was kind of passing into the atmosphere in a way. It was like... Uh, collective consciousness or something like you're just part of this, you're a tool of this greater thing and happy to be so.